welcome everyone who is here today for our online talks program. My name is Inir Val and I'm the founder of the art organization, The Cero Project. Um, many of you might not know what is The Cero Project, as I will try to share a little bit of our story. So the idea of Cero started in 2010 when I was researching about indigenous art in Australia for my MA uh, in curatorial studies. But it was only in 2016 when I actually moved to UK that I create this, I, I materialize it as a curatorial project. And today, almost 10 years after um, of being in Australia, Zero Pros is an organization now um, for the promotion and exhibition of contemporary art that falls outside of Eurocentric and Western narratives, where we develop, curate, and collaborate on curatorial projects, exhibitions, and events across the world. Our, currently, uh, we are having a, an art program here in Portugal, which we call Ventsum, and is a collaboration with our partner in Portugal, Trasfoldago, which we can see here in, in my back, the space that we are holding now an exhibition. Um, today, the reason why we are here is because I'm collaborating with the artist Ekvenia Emmets uh, in a long-term art project, which we call Say My Name and I Will Tell You My Story, which is also part of this Ventusu program, where we aim to rethink stories, memories, narratives about eucalyptus trees here in Portugal, as well in the Western world and to indigenous cultures. This project will have different phases of engagement and outcomes, including exhibitions, which we have one here on the back, some installations, gastronomic experience, and more important, we hope that this project bridges people from different backgrounds and knowledge and life experience to collaborate with us and make our project also part of theirs, because only with true collaborations where people immerse themselves in what they believe that we can actually generate some change in the world that we all have to learn to respect and protect for the future generations. Thank you, Inesh, for such a beautiful introduction. I will continue. My name is Evgenia Emmets. I'm an artist and um, I would love to share with you a little bit about the work that I have prepared in the framework of this project. So in this project, uh, say my name and I will tell you my story. The protagonist and the centerpiece of, the, of this work is eucalyptus tree. And I have developed a special relationship with this tree here in Portugal since um, three years, since I have been observing the ecological scene and the cultural scene here and since I've been working with forests. And all the artistic work has been done for this project in a very intuitive way. Uh, using natural materials that the tree has to offer uh, in, quite, in quite organic way. It's all from the forest, the eucalyptus leaves and the bark from the tree. And I'm printing directly with these materials on fabric. And I believe that through this, the eucalyptus tree or the gum tree, as these trees are called in Australia, where they come from, they gain the voice and they express their own messages in their own way and open for us humans a possibility to ask them questions, to collaborate with them, to co-create with them and um, tell an alternative story that is emerging. And we are hoping um, to create a holistic perspective on this tree, which um, these trees, they exist in abundance in this country in Portugal because of the widespread use in monoculture plantations for paper production and a series of quite controversial socio-cultural relationships that have been developed over the years. Through our series of conversations, um, we believe that there is a possibility to embrace the presence of these trees here and uh, to really look closely at their purpose of being in this country in a wider cultural sense while integrating newly emerging wisdom from research, science, but also traditional Aboriginal knowledge in Australia, where these trees are originally from. We hope that you enjoy this exhibition at the Spacios Paleoagua, which is still on until the 6th of November in Lisbon. 
our online exhibition experience, but also the series of conversations that we are holding online with our wonderful speakers. So my name is Evgenia Emmets and I'm an artist and uh, we are going to introduce the project and we are going to introduce our guest speaker today um, to start with. I can see some people already writing uh, in the chat. So I'm inviting you once again to introduce yourself, say where you're based right now and write a little bit about how you connect with nature. And if you have a little story about eucalyptus trees, we would really appreciate you writing that too. And I'm going to pass on to Ines Valle and let her introduce herself and the project to start with. Thank you, Ekbeni. Um, hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome you all uh, who are here today on this online talks program. Um, probably you are from different parts of the world and so it's like amazing so here we are in lisbon uh, Egveni and i we are here in portugal so it's like 10 a.m um philip is in australia so it's like we are almost 11 hours apart so it's really a privilege to have everyone here um so uh my name is inishval as Egveni mentioned and i'm the founder of the art organization the civil project um and many of you might not know what is Sarah Project. So I'll share just a little bit of the story um, of what it is and how did it started. Um, so in 2010, when I was researching about indigenous art uh, for my MA, um, you know, while I was in Australia, uh, this is how everything started. So then I moved to UK in 2016, and then Sarah Project materialized it as a curatorial project. So today, almost like 10 years after, uh, this is an art organization for the promotion and exhibition of contemporary art that falls outside of Eurocentric and Western narratives. And we try to work with different people uh, and different pro projects that aim to encourage critical engagement with contemporary global issues to foster dialogue between different fields of knowledge and invite people to think differently about art globalization and the relationship that we have with the world. Currently, we have a program here in Portugal, which we call Vento which happens both online and our Lisbon partner, uh, the gallery Espaço Espelho d'Agua. And we have the privilege of having the support of the GH, which is the which is part of the Ministry of Culture here in Portugal. Um, part of this program is this long-term project that I have been working with in collaboration with Agvenia and we call it Say My Name and I Will Tell You My Story, where we aim to rethink stories, memories, and narratives about eucalyptus trees here in Portugal, in the Western world, as well in the indigenous cultures. Uh, as many of you might be aware, in Portugal, this tree is not the most loved one, commonly associated with monocultures, drying soils, fires, desertification. Thus, for us, it was really important to talk about eucalyptus and our project will have like so many phases and points of discussion. So this is really the beginning, but more important for us is that we hope that with this project, we build bridges between people from different backgrounds of knowledge and life experience to collaborate with us and make our project as also part of theirs. Because uh, we believe that with true collaborations where people emerge themselves in what they believe then we can actually generate some changes in the world and learn to respect and protect or preserve it for future generations. So I'm passing now to Egvenia. She was going to speak a little bit about their artistic practice and what she actually wants to do with this eucalyptus. Um, so as many of you already know, um, my work uh, in the past, I've been living in Portugal for the last three years. I'm an artist and a poet. I work with forest ecology and this work really started more or less as I moved to Portugal three years ago. And the main project, ongoing project, it's a lifelong project I'm working on, is called Eternal Forest. Um, and for me, exploring the significance of presence of any 
kind of elements of the ecosystem is incredibly important within this project on ecological, cultural, spiritual levels. And of course, while living in Portugal, as Inesha already mentioned, we cannot avoid the question of eucalyptus tree or gum trees as they're called in Australia, in the original land. Um, this project came about uh, through a dream that I had uh, about 10, 11 months ago in which eucalyptus tree presented itself to me. And through that, I started listening and tuning more uh, into the presence of these beings. At the beginning, I was very much um, not ready to start this conversation, uh, even on purely artistic level. But through meeting in Ash and through proposing that idea, we realized that perhaps there is no better time than now. Um, through the artistic work that I've done so far within this project, I purely approached it on a very intuitive level. I just uh, started working with the trees directly with the natural kind of materials that they offer in the forest with the bark and the leaves that they shed quite naturally and the forest or let's say monocultures where I go to collect them, they are full of it. Um, eucalyptus trees are present both in monocultures and in mixed forests already in Portugal because they have been here since at least 200 years. And um, I think in this project, we're really trying to look more at a possibility of holistic perspective on that species, on that tree, on that being. And instead of thinking, well, you know, how can we only look at the problematics of it? We are thinking, how can we look at the tree as a being and offer it the space to express its own voice and its own messages? And this is what I've done with my work. I decided that um, through botanical printing and through some other techniques that I've used already before in my practice, I would like to just let the tree guide me. So I print it with leaves and the bark through the complex chemical and steaming process where where the natural tannins are just being printed in the fabric and they're just being left there. Um, and of course, the tree guides me also in terms of geometric forms and shapes. And a lot of inspiration comes directly from this interaction. It's quite meditative practice in the studio. And I feel that there is a lot more to discover for me personally, artistically and to explore. Um, but I think what's even more important that is emerging is we are really feeling that it's a beautiful moment to try to open up um, this whole conversation to be able to move from hate to neutral to perhaps love because I do experience love towards this tree personally and I would love to understand with this project how we can really engage with a true purpose and a possibility of expanding knowledge and uh, various possibilities around the presence of these trees. So uh, we are embracing with this a possibility of working together with Aboriginal people in Australia and embracing Aboriginal knowledge. This is also partially what the tree is telling us. It's telling, well, why don't you ask the people who know this tree within ecosystems best? And I think today is this conversation that we are having with Dr. Philip Clark is one of these uh, first steps of trying to open this door and open that space for inviting larger wisdom and deeper and more ancient knowledge. And uh, once again, before we start and before I introduce Philip Clark, I would like to say the exhibition is open until the 6th of November, inclusive. So please come visit. We, Inesh and I will be in the space all day. And it will be really lovely if you can come see the work and engage kind of directly and to see what came out. Um, so, so today uh, we are going to talk about the indigenous knowledge and wisdom uh, about eucalyptus plants. Um, in medicine, in food, in art, in everyday objects, uh, we are aware that the tree is also considered sacred in many communities for some reasons, and we're going to try to unpack that. And the question is, how can we look at this tree differently here in Europe, but also in other places in the world where it's kind of mixed relationship? 
and how can we learn from this indigenous wisdom. And with huge pleasure, I would like to introduce Dr. Philip Clark, who is today with us and kindly um, agreed to be able to talk about his work and say a few words about him. Uh, Dr. Philip Clark has academic background in biology, geography, anthropology. He calls himself ethnographer. He has studied in the University of Adelaide and started working with Aboriginal ethnographic collections at the South Australian Museum in 82. And his initial focus in Aboriginal use of plants as foods, medicines and materials for making various artifacts expressed through uh, publishing various books, articles, um, consultancy collaborations with Aboriginal associations and working closely within museums and universities all across Australia. His work right now today expands to such various topics as studies of Aboriginal mythology, indigenous adaptation to climate change, indigenous foods and their possible commercialization. And today we have huge pleasure to have him with us to unveil a little bit about what is eucalyptus in Australia uh, or gum trees as they are called. And um, the, first questions th uh, the first question that we would like to ask him is to unpack a little bit about eucalyptus genus to just give us a little bit of perspective. What is the eucalyptus genus? Uh, to talk a little bit about the names of how these three can be called and what are the names, possible names for eucalyptus in different languages. Is there a common name or there are different definitions? And what is a gum tree in any way? So over to you, Philippe. I am going to mute myself. Okay. Um... Well, I'm talking from Adelaide in Australia, so I hope that everyone can hear me. Um, um, your question is actually quite a big one because it involves both the scientific name eucalyptus and, of course, uh, the common name gum tree. And uh, when the British colonists uh, first came to Australia in um, eight, uh, 1878, uh, they came across um, um, a variety of trees which were exuding things like gums and resins. And uh, um, back then, this is before uh, the petrochemical revolution in the world, uh, um, the world did rely quite a bit on plant products from various trees, um, the things like varnishes, medicines, um, all sorts of chemicals. So they were naturally very interested. So. The, uh, the first tree that they actually called a gum tree around Sydney when it was uh, settled in 1788 uh, was actually what we now call a grass tree, uh, quite a different looking thing, uh, more of a lily uh, tree from a lily family rather than a eucalyptus family, the Myrtaceae. However, as time went, uh, went on, um, these big trees, uh, which sort of dominate all the, the forests around Sydney and the greater part of Australia, particularly the higher rainfall areas are, are, are gum trees, uh, eucalyptus trees. And uh, a standard forest, say, around Sydney would have four or five uh, different species. And uh, you can sort of see they're different because of the different sort of uh, trunks they've got. Uh, some of them are clear, some of them are uh, sort of patchy, some of them are very hard, they're called iron barks. And um, so th there's these mixed forests and uh, I guess from uh, what I've been hearing in Portugal, of course, you, you just got the one species, often Eucalyptus globulus, our Tasmanian blue gum. And so you're growing monocultures. Well, in Australia, the gum trees uh, very rarely occur in a, in a monoculture. They're, they're always part of a, um, a sort of mixed forest with different species of, of, of other eucalypts. Um, and also uh, an understory and um, you know, lower growing plants. So, um, you know, in, in a biodiversity uh, sort of environment, uh, the gum trees are a crucial part of it, but it, it's certainly not the only part of it. So um, uh, it should be sort of seen as uh, one element of uh, a much more sort of complex uh, forest. In terms of the genus, um, initially, uh, most of those big things which we call gum trees, <clears throat> they call gum, but in, in reality, the uh, 
the uh, exudate, the, the gum-like material that comes out of it, it's called a, a kino, K-I-N-O. And uh, it's not, uh, unlike gum, which should be dissolvable in water, the kino needs uh, something like alcohol, something a bit more organically complex to dissolve it. So, uh, so technically, uh, it's a misnomer. They're not, they're not really gum trees at all. Um, the original grass trees are more like gum trees, but uh, these eucalypts are uh, 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 chemi chemically, their exudate is uh, far more complex. Um, there are roughly about 600 odd species, which the botanists recognise, but within the last 10, 15 years, uh, the botanists have been looking at that genus and they've decided that a big chunk of them are actually uh, really deserve to be in a different genus and they've called that Corumbia. So uh, some of our classic gum trees like the uh, the gum trees, the ghost gums that uh, the people like uh, Albert Namajira, the famous uh, water colorist um, in Central Australia, he used to paint ghost gums in his paintings. Well, uh, actually they were uh, Corumbia Papuana now, they're not actually in the eucalyptus genus. But nevertheless, we've inherited this uh, in Australia, this uh, system of calling all of these big trees, which are sort of botanically related in uh, um, the Myrtaceae family, uh, we tend to call them gum trees. There's also a few other genera, there's the Angophora, which are often called apple gums. And uh, there's even uh, a family of um, uh, well, a genus of uh, plants which are, are called Eugenia, of all things, uh, a bit similar to an artist's name, but they're uh, things like lilipillies, which have ed edible fruit. So it's quite an interesting family, the Myrtaceae, and it, to many way, in many ways, it defines Australia. Um, you can't imagine Australia without the gum trees, but there are, there are various genera uh, within that family, which uh, uh, are also very prominent. The family, Myrtaceae family, also includes the Melaleucas and the, what, uh, which were co often called bottle brushes and things like tea trees. And um, together, eucalypts and tea trees uh, produce all these fantastic oils and things that, which we use in making um, cosmetics and medicine, that kind of thing. So it's a, yeah, it's a very important family. I also know from uh, my field work in East Timor, which is a former Portuguese colony that, uh, there are five or six species of gum tree that are, occur on East Timor. So you could actually say that the eucalyptus genus is uh, part of Portugal, um, you know, in the sense that, it, you know, your former territory there. Um, those species are also ones that occur on the mainland of Australia. So to actually work out how, why they are in uh, parts of Indonesia and New Guinea, you, one has to look at the biogeography of what we call Wallace's line, where you've got these Australian species that have sort of pushed into some of the land masses to the, uh, uh, to the north and to the, uh, the west. So yes, uh, um, so we have these uh, things we call gum trees. Most of them are eucalypts. A few of them are actually in the eucalyptus genus. Uh, a few of them are corumbia, but it's also usually used in some of the other plants that occur in this Myrtaceae family, which uh, pretty much define Australia. And uh, um, because of that definition, um, it, they are plants that really do love fire. Um, there are parts of Australia where there are rainforests and uh, if the rainforests get burnt too, too often, they get replaced by forests of eucalypts. Um, so uh, whether one wants to call the eucalyptus genus sort of predatory in the sense of being fire loving and, um, but yes, if you have a, a if you have a forest of eucalypts, you, you will get more fires. I mean, even um, some of the adaptive strategies of eucalypts, you know, with the long trailing bark and uh, the, the way that the, uh, the cambium layer sits within the tree, uh, you can tell that the plant really loves being burnt and, and it even likes uh, passing the fire through its loose bark onto other trees. So the fire actually travels through the canopy, uh, not necessarily the ground. So yes, it's a very interesting it's a very interesting genus, uh, uh, group of plants, and one that in Australia with climate change, with our increasing fires, um, you know, that we're still coming to terms with. How, how can we reduce fires and yet basically have forests that have these fire-loving, um, you know, trees that are dominating?
Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, Philip, for giving us a bit of heads up about um, about eucalyptus trees. And of course, even in Australia, I'm aware already that even in Australia, there are some problems and some questions. And uh, ecologically speaking, um, yeah, it's not it's not always that easy because there's also plantations and also when eucalyptus trees are being moved from one place to another for specific productive purposes, it can also cause problems. Um, I would love to I would love to maybe go a little bit more into your research and ask you a question about your work uh, related to indigenous astronomy and maybe give us a couple of examples from that area and from mythology connected to tall trees and specifically if you can make a couple of examples uh, from connection with eucalyptus trees and how how it all ties together with the landscape and the presence of these trees. Um, yes well uh, Aboriginal beliefs about the uh, the sky world the heavens are uh, are uh, well probably shared with with uh, some other cultures around the world in in that they're sort of seen as a continuation of the uh, the earth landscape the terrestrial landscape so it's sort of like a folded over piece of uh, the landscape a, a very connected part of the landscape uh, uh, whereas in modern western european thought we we know that whatever's up there is sort of not quite infinitely uh, far away but certainly a long way away whereas Aboriginal people believe that someone who is very good at throwing spears could actually probably throw a spear high enough to actually lodge in the uh, the star earth you know the part of the sky world and uh, if they had a rope on the end of that or, or managed to throw other spears to hit the first spear they could build a ladder to climb up there. Another way of course was to actually climb very tall trees um, so people who are regarded as medicine men, very uh, powerful, generally men, sometimes women, but very powerful people in terms of their knowledge would climb up these trees, go up to the sky and um, gain new knowledge because the sky is where all the ancestors uh, after the creation ended up. So, uh, and the sky world was seen as having all the animals and plants from the terrestrial plane actually in the sky. So it was certainly populated by eucalypts. So from the perspective of people say in Western Victoria, where they heavily uh, utilize the, uh, the manna coming off the manna gum, which is eucalyptus viminalis, um, they thought in their utopian view of the sky world that when they died, their spirit would go up via the uh, east or the west, because that's where the sky world dips and touches the earth. Um, they'd end up in the sky world where there are more of these trees and there'd be a land of plenty. They'd be eating the manna off these eucalyptus viminalis trees. Um, so that's sort of one connection. Um, the eucalypts as tall trees, uh, they, they sort of turn up in various other myths and you know, there's about 300 odd uh, different language groups across Australia and numerous dialects. And of course there's the mythology is quite you know, vastly different from region to region, but you do find there's lots of, uh, in the records um, and people's beliefs, lots of accounts of eucalypts being trees, which you could, um, you know, climb up and uh, get into the sky world. So um, some of the myths talk about ancestors having climbed up the tree and uh, then some other ancestor coming along and either setting fire to the tree or chopping it down and and the ancestors being caught in the trees. So there's, uh, there's one account again from Victoria of um, these cockatoos, which are rather large, white, noisy birds in Australia uh, um, flying around. They're the pointers in the sky and they're, they're always looking for the gum tree, which was their favorite roost, which uh, got chopped off from its connection to the, the, the terrestrial plane and ended up in the, uh, the sky, sometimes the Southern Cross. So, we're looking at a sky world which has all these features pretty much um, you know just like the terrestrial plane and uh, of course the ancestors are up there and the, when people Aboriginal people died they believe their spirit also went up there so the trees are, a, a, are an essential uh, part of that landscape often the uh, the Milky Way in, in for many groups was seen as a creek so 
some of the uh, darker areas in the Milky Way of the ponds and then some of the other stars uh, along on the edge of the Milky Way are things like reeds growing on the edge of the uh, creek and then further out some of the other constellations being things like gum trees. So Aboriginal people sort of saw a, to some extent a reflection of the uh, landscape they were standing on. Um, but it, it's probably better seen as a continuation um, around Adelaide uh, through the middle of our city there's a creek called the uh, Torrens uh, River and uh, Aboriginal people here believe that the the headwaters of that river was actually in the sky above them so they sort of saw it all curved above them. However that landscape's a bit more complex as it also has an underworld so I often think because I've over the years I've written a few papers and think chapters and books about the uh, ethnoastronomy about the beliefs in the sky and yeah. I've often thought in order to uh, reflect that uh, relationship that, um, you know, one would really need the skills of that famous artist Escher, who used to draw these impossible drawings, uh, you know, which uh, you'd look at one part of it and then it would sort of morph into to a totally different perspective. But it's more of a problem from the European uh, observer because we've got a, a view of uh, space which does actually have those three dimensions. Uh, from the Aboriginal point of view, they tended to see it as a two-dimensional thing that sort of uh, that folded over. So uh, it's yeah, it's more of a more of a problem from the European point of view trying to represent that in a in a drawing. But yes, gum gum trees, eucalypts are uh, you know an important part of the uh, the framework uh, and. Uh, in some areas, uh, particularly when Europeans first arrived around Sydney in the, the late 18th century, uh, um, the news of their arrival spread across Australia among the Aboriginal communities and, and um, with them came smallpox with the uh, settlers arriving, lots of people were dying. Um, so the irony being that Aboriginal people were suffering from European colonisation probably in some areas 50 years before they actually ever saw a European because of the disease. Um, nevertheless, they thought, well, um, that somehow the vault of the heaven, the, the sky world had collapsed and uh, it was being supported by these uh, uh, poles made from gum trees at either end. And they thought the way of fixing that was to send all these uh, present skin rugs and axes and things to the east um, to sort of pay all of these sorcerers whose job it was to look after the uh, these struts, these wooden struts made from gum trees that were supporting the heavens. And uh, so that was a sort of a, an early response from Aboriginal people for European colonization. They thought that they were the, the their own dead spirits coming, sort of falling down from the sky, you know, via the east, which is where the uh, vault of the heavens touched the the earthly plane and they thought by sending presents and things that way yeah, yeah. that perhaps they would um, you know end up uh, uh, restoring the vault and uh, stopping all of these uh, you know bad spirits coming down um, so yes you, it's uh, it's sort of interesting to see how the belief system was used in order to interpret the actual arrival of Europeans um, and that's a common run, run around the world. Um, when you look at the first Im impressions that indigenous peoples have had when, when they've had a, uh, out of the blue, you know, a colonizing power suddenly turn up and on their doorstep and uh, all, these, uh, all these things start to happen. So, so yes, gum trees are even part of that story. Well, thank you, Philip. I think maybe we could uh, talk a lot about a bit of food uh, uses of the various species of eucalyptus across Aboriginal uh, Australian people like mana, larps, nectars, uh, the leaves for wrapping when people are cooking. I don't know if you can teach us a little bit or how these are ent actually entering to the mainstream at the moment. How are these actually happening? Well, I guess starting at the mainstream, it's sort of are probably starting at the other end in terms of the uh, indigenous knowledge. Um, um, I, uh, I've just had a paper published with a number of other uh, uh, researchers on the, the use of LERP now. 
But most of us Australians, when we hear lerp, we know that they're those white flaky scale insects that sort of a covering that appears as almost like a disease on the gum leaves. So things like the river red gum um, during summer when the, uh, you know, hasn't been as much rain, the, the sugars are high in the sap, then suddenly all these uh, scale insects start uh, burrowing into the leaves and they protect themselves by having building these white flaky uh, coverings. Um, but when you've got many thousands of, of such insects doing it on one tree, you end up with a tree which um, has all these white flakes all over the leaves to a ridiculous degree where it almost takes away the greenness of the tree. Now, they are quite sweet. Um, it is an insect product, not a plant product, but for most people looking at the tree, you'd think it was part of the tree. So Aboriginal people uh, right across Australia, um, when this season used to come about, uh, it's usually in the uh, dry season, just before the rains come in. So in Northern Australia, as soon as the monsoon comes in, all these scale insects get washed away. So it's no longer a food source, but while it's still reasonably dry, you've got these lerps, these scale insects, and you can scrape them off, build them into a ball, you know, about this size. They're like almost, almost, they've been described almost like the soccer ball. And you can actually store it for quite some time and it's uh, very sweet. And um, so, yes, it was a, a useful food source. People used to, uh, Aboriginal people used to make sure that they were the right part of their country where the, uh, uh, say in, Southern Australia, it was often the mallee trees that tended to have more of these lerps. So they would make sure they were there and uh, scrape all this up. And they'd almost just eat that for several weeks and uh, get quite heavy on it. And um, when the rains came, of course, the lerp had gone and they'd move on. Um, but yes, fast forward to the present. Um, um, I've been doing some work with the Arana Foundation, which uh, uh, the chef, we call him a celebrity chef. He's on TV every night for various programs, but I believe he's very big over in Europe as well. But he, uh, um, he's he been promoting these various Australian food sources, trying to develop a more of an indigenous sort of um, style cooking in Australia. And uh, he's very interested in lerps, particularly for things. And he, he runs a couple of restaurants and uh, for, for using um, as a covering on ice creams and various things. It's a subtle flavour. It's not like pure white sugar, but it's uh, it takes on a bit of the flavour of the gum tree and it, it's sort of sweet. So it, it actually probably takes a chef really to use it properly. Um, you know, some foods, uh, things like chilies, uh, you wouldn't think of eating unless you <laughs> knew how to use them. And it's a bit like that with lerps, I suspect. So there's been a lot of interest in, in lerps as a as a possible new food source to introduce to the Australians and perhaps the the, the rest of the world, because after all, they're um, you know they're they're probably uh, almost as many uh, gum trees growing in India and uh, parts of Europe and Africa now as there are in Australia. So it's uh, you know as a as a species, it's uh, it's spread, and so these lerps uh, uh, have certainly spread to some of those other countries as sort of pests. I've been talking to some of the scientists who uh, are looking at using it. And of course, to introduce a new food source, you, you really need continuity of supply and you need uh, sort of standards and, you know, it's a whole lot of things. So it's actually quite expensive to produce a wild food source and develop it to something that you'll see in the supermarket shelf. And um, of course, you can't rely on wild harvest, particularly in Australia here. We don't, our seasons, um, are, are, are irregular at the best of times. So you couldn't actually build an industry, uh, you know, based on just the normal season. So um, one has to look at horticulture for producing things like lerps, which means growing some of these trees in glass houses and trying to stop all the birds who are the natural predators of uh, things like we call pardalokes, the small birds, they almost exclusively uh, eat lerps. I should explain too that we call them lerps in Australian English, but that's uh, based on an Aboriginal word, uh, larap, um, from Western Victoria. So it's one of those words that sort of crossed from an Aboriginal language into the Australian English. Um, so yes, there's a lot of interesting work just looking at the uh, the insects. Um, but of course, gum trees uh, 
uh, have got so many other things going for them and um, they're a major source of uh, wood grubs, which uh, again, we call witchetty grubs taken from uh, another Aboriginal word, one from my state, um, based on the, the, the word for the hook that's used to pull them out of the trunk of the tree. But you've got all these beautiful uh, grubs. Um, some of them are from beetle larva, some of them are from moths, but um, these large grubs that uh, in the grub stage are borers. So they drill holes you know, into these trees. So uh, they're actually, uh, they were a major source of food. And there have been a few restaurants and a few uh, chefs who have tried to introduce those uh, into the Australian cuisine. I remember some years ago, even seeing someone who had actually canned all these uh, grubs uh, and uh, trying to sell them. I think because Australia is mainly, well, up until recently, at least mainly had European people of European descent, there's probably been a bit of pushback on them. But uh, I think now that we've got more people, particularly from Asia and other parts of the world living here, maybe it's, uh, you know, eating insects is not seen as a bad thing. I mean, uh, people from English uh, heritage would gladly eat a shrimp, but somehow, you know, wouldn't want to eat a uh, cockroach or, or something that's pretty much just the same, but it, it's sort of, it's an insect, it's not a crustacean, so therefore it's bad. So you've, you've got all these cultural uh, um, barriers to sort of cross, but I think Australia will, will solve that just because we're becoming um, less European as time goes on. Um, so I think all these things become a, more of a possibility. So yes, the gum tree has lots of grubs in it as well, the, both the roots and the, the trunk. And uh, people used a, a little hook on the end of a very whippy stick and used to sort of shove it in and try to, you know, uh, uh, a bit like whaling, I guess, but with a much smaller scale, try to get this hook embedded in the body of the grub and sort of extract it. But yes, the trees, um, they have edible seed. It's a look got a lot of tannin in it but um there's so much of these fine seeds it's uh, it's one of those great ironies that uh you know eucalypts are the tallest hardwoods in the world and yet they have some of the smallest seeds for trees but they they produce them by the ton so it's a food source that um say in the desert area people could break off a few branches of the tree and uh, just put the branches on a dry bit of a salt pan or or a large flat rock and let them dry out and the seeds would you know bang the branch and the seeds would come out and they would sort of uh, make what we call a damper over here it's sort of a bit like a biscuit but you know you bake all these seeds and um, um, sometimes it, prior to that you soak them in water you try and get rid of as many of the tannins but you can make a quite an interesting biscuit out of it so it's it's quite an important food source so all these trees, uh, eucalypts have uh, got edible seed if you're prepared to uh, put in the processing. The flowers, uh, you know, we use for making sweet drinks. So you soak them over overnight in a wooden bowl uh, in water. So you can produce what they call in Creole cool drink. Um, so that's a, another sort of food source. Also, some of the, uh, the trees that have what, it's a sort of a gall. It's, a, it's actually a disease part of the, uh, the branch which becomes very woody um, sort of some of them almost fist shaped and while they're still green um, they like uh, they're called bush coconut in the creole um, they're often caused by a, a wasp that's got this uh, uh, fungus that it spreads to the various trees and infects the uh, the branches and the you know lays its uh, eggs in it and you know the larva from these wasps actually uh, live off the inside of the galls but for aboriginal people these galls uh, have got a nice insect in them to eat and i've tried it; it's not too bad it's also got a sack of water in it but more importantly the the uh, the flesh that the tree puts around where the wasp is in these galls they look like coconuts they put hence bush coconuts is is actually like coconuts, quite nice and sweet. So I, I've become quite a fan of it when I'm, uh, you know, out bush. But it's only when it's green. So that that's the bush coconut, and that tends to occur on things we call bloodwoods, which uh, I've, from the last ten years is now corumbia rather than eucalyptus. But but still, uh, it's still part of that 
you know, cluster of trees we call gum trees. So that's, a, that's another food source. But of course the trees have hollows in them. So there's all these uh, um, ways of getting the possums that smoking them out sometimes, lighting a fire at the bottom of the tree and smoking out the possums and then grabbing them and killing them, eating them. So, so the gum tree becomes uh, uh, the source of so many things that you know, there's birds that lay their eggs in nests, sometimes in the hollows or in the branches. So uh, Aboriginal people cut notches in the tree trunk. And some of these gums don't have a, their lowest branch might be 30 metres up above the, uh, the ground. So quite an effort to climb up there. So yes, the gum tree becomes a, a source of food in so many ways in terms of being relied upon by uh, animals, uh, which are game species for Aboriginal people, but having all these uh, edible bits and pieces. In some desert areas, uh, the, what we call a mallee, which is based on an Aboriginal word from Wemba Wemba language in Western Victoria, it's a low growing tree. It used to, it, you would actually mistake it as for of a bush, but botanists have found that some of them are many hundreds of years old. They have this uh, large root structure underground, which uh, even though the top of the tree gets burnt off, it keeps springing up again. So uh, like the phoenix, Anyway, these, these uh, mallees also have a type of root which grows uh, horizontally just underneath the surface of the ground. And during the infrequent rains, it, uh, they very quickly, uh, the very cellular, soak up all the water. Aboriginal people realised this and in, in some areas uh, where there was no surface water, they would spend the whole year out there basically just digging up these lateral branches just under, sorry, roots just underneath the surface. and. Uh, breaking them into 10 centimetre, 15 centimetre bits, turning them on the end. And sometimes they'd even heat them to speed it up to you know, get all this water dripping out of the, the, uh, the roots. So you had people who were living, literally living on uh, the water out of these eucalyptus, uh, these mallee tree uh, roots. So it's even a source of water. Up in the tropics, um, <clears throat> there are other trees which uh, have natural uh, gum trees that have natural cavities in them which were sort of like little pockets of water which uh, Aboriginal people would work out where they were just by looking at all the uh, the ant trail up the the trunk because the ants were using as a source of water too so they if they were short of water they would look for ant trails on these gum trees and uh, sort of chop into them to get a, a few mouthfuls of water which would uh, be perhaps enough to uh, get them by to the you know get to the next waterhole so um yeah so gum trees are very important as a source of water you wouldn't think that but both physically in terms of having reserves in them as, as well as uh, as their roots um i could go on and on but yes the if you looked at the uh, genus of gum trees they're uh, a very important sort of source of food and water and also medicine and uh, i haven't haven't even touched upon uh, the use of their leaves in uh, cooking in earth, earth ovens, but uh, um, you know, that in itself is a, 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 is a chapter in terms of how, how they can be utilized in cooking. Mm -hmm. So mm. Philip, thank you so much. It feels like in 15 minutes, we learned so much about um, all the different uh, richnesses and diversities that eucalyptus trees are offering just on the level of food uh, the cultural practices. I wanted to ask you uh, just to tell us a little bit uh, about honey, because this is something that I think in Portugal we can relate to really well. Um, uh, honey, eucalyptus honey is very widespread here. I, I personally tried um, eucalyptus honey from two different types of eucalyptus trees, of course, eucalyptus globulus. Um, actually, around my area they're blossoming at the moment they're really really beautiful these white tassel flowers and i have my local producer who delivers to me a beautiful jar of raw honey from eucalyptus globulus but there are other types around portugal and it's very distinct taste it's very dark it's very yeah it's very tangy kind of uh, taste i'd like uh, to ask you to share with us maybe a story or some something about the ways, traditional ways of collecting um, and consuming honey from eucalyptus trees. And maybe you could share with us a little bit on that subject. 
Well, I, I'll probably start by agreeing with you that uh, eucalyptus honey is some of the best honey you can get because you really do get the flavour. And uh, there are certain trees when they um, uh, start flowering and a lot of the gum trees, because we're, as I said earlier, we're a continent with very irregular seasons. So the, the beekeepers as a group work out where the gum trees are flowering in Australia and they actually put all their hives in their trucks and things and may, may even drive a thousand kilometres away to set up all their bees to take, uh, take advantage of the uh, flowering of the gums. Now these are European bees, the Apis mellifera, uh, which is still the bee which produces the most honey. So uh, Australia has indigenous bees which uh, uh, form hives and um, you, know, you can get honey out of, but nowhere near as efficient as the uh, uh, European honeybee. So, uh, so it's not really challenge. There's, there's no way we can get an Australian bee that we know of that we could actually produce uh, commercially to, to get anywhere near uh, competing with the uh, European honeybee. And there are parts of Australia like Kangaroo Island in my state, very early on, because it's far enough away from the mainland, it had Lucurian bees, uh, which I believe somewhere from Italy uh, put there. And they're the purest strain of that type of bee in the world. So it's actually Kangaroo Island is famous for its uh, honey and it's all produced by this particular strain of uh, European honeybee. Getting back to the Australian species, um, Aboriginal people used to certainly eat the honey, but they used to make a bit of a mash. They would take a bit of the cone and, and also the larva, uh, larvae of the, uh, the bees and they'd mash it all together. So they were actually eating a, uh, like a sweet meat, a bit of a mixture of the cone and the uh, honey and the actual grubs uh, all mashed into one. Um, in the in the Kimberley area, uh, uh, for, for whatever reason, that's north uh, northwest of Australia. Uh, um, yeah, it's a very good country for bees, and uh, Aboriginal people used to go to extraordinary lengths of uh, uh, of actually uh, obtaining it. Um, it was a very, you know. Uh, one of their main sources of sugar. So um, I think every human society has got a passion for, for things like drugs and things which are sweet. So Aboriginal people are no different than any other society. So they expend a lot of labor for things which uh, on the face of it may not be the best for them, but uh, they see a lot of honey. The cone is um, very important in the uh, symbolism of you know, moving from the Kimberley across to the top end where I do a lot of field work. It's very important in the symbolism of the uh, art and the uh, high culture. So bark paintings, uh, which you may be familiar with, these are elaborate drawings, very symbolic, often on, on you know, sheets of bark. Uh, you, um, you'll find the symbolism of the uh, hive, you know, and the cone structure there in the uh, sort of background of the paintings. So uh, that's something that you'll see quite a bit. I, I was collecting, um, for some of my writings sort of working on Aboriginal use of insects um, that right across Australia there was sort of one technique of uh, finding the hives in a forest where you've got lots of bushes and trees and sometimes the hive is quite a fair way up the tree. So what Aboriginal people would do is actually catch one of these native bees which are smaller than the European bee, often black, and uh, but they wouldn't hurt the bee, they would sort of catch it but they would use a bit of gum and they would stick either a feather, a very small feather or a awn off of a daisy flower. You know how they've got almost feathery like structures. So they'd stick this on the abdomen of the bee and then they'd let it go. And uh, you could imagine two or three, you know, uh, perhaps young men, uh, teenagers uh, scrambling through the scrub, you know, through the bush uh, chasing this bee and they can see it because they can see the, the the feather or the, the white thing. Um, if it was just the bee, they'd have no hope. It's sort of dark and they're in the forest, but they'd follow this feather. And sometimes maybe they'd have to do that once or twice, uh, two or three times, you know, catch a bee if they couldn't quite find the tree, but eventually they'd find the tree. And um, in various means, they would climb up there and, you know, with their stone ax sort of chop into it and, you know, get the honey. But these native bees, uh, uh, I think there are a few that got a sting that you wouldn't want to be, you know, have too often, but generally they're stingless. So uh, I guess that's one advantage uh, up against the European bee. Uh, 
um, you know, much easier to uh, get, you know, uh, uh, to collect. But uh, yes, honey, honey was uh, quite important. Um, unfortunately, with the um, so many organisms, exotic organisms introduced to Australia that the European bee pretty much displaced all of the native bees uh, in much of its range. So it's mainly central Australia, parts of Eastern Australia and across the north where you, you get the native, what we call the native bees, usually in the, uh, from the genus Trigonia. Um, I've spoken to some of the uh, entomologists because I, uh, I was for almost 30 years in the museum. So I ended up being the, uh, the head of science or the boss of all these, uh, not just the anthropologists, but all these taxonomists who were studying all the insects and animals. And uh, they were still discovering these native bees. And sometimes uh, they'd want to use an Aboriginal name as a species name. So they would ask me, you know, to look up the records of the appropriate language from where they'd found this new species to try and get a, you know, a name to, to recognize their Aboriginal importance. Um, but yes, that's, uh, that's native bees. So I, I'm not suggesting that native bees are, are going to displace um, or their products are going to displace European honey. I think the world is pretty much, um, you know, built on the European honeybee. So they've been a very successful species. And uh, um, like a lot of these Australian bush foods, uh, maybe it's a boutique market for some of them. Um, you know, certainly some uh, restaurants can perhaps in low quantities use some of these bush foods, but, but getting something like native bee honey, um, you know, uh, marketed and, and in a form which would then appear in supermarkets and things that it's not going to happen or, or certainly any time in in, uh, in the future as I can see. Mm, thank you so much Philip this is really beautiful to hear that story and I'm I'm personally really looking forward to trying the um, the honey from from the local bees <laughs> one day um, I would love to take our conversation into traditional Aboriginal uses, medicinal uses of various species of eucalyptus trees. And if you could talk a little bit about like most common uses and how they have transformed with the colonization and how they are maybe uh, moving more into commercial market and to well-being market at the moment. So what are the most interesting uses and what can we learn from that? Yeah, look, um, um, eucalyptus oils being, um, you know, the colonists, English colonists, British colonists were very quick on picking up on that um, when they first came to Australia. Um, it's a very strong smelling, uh, as you would know, in Portugal, um, particularly, I think you've mainly got the Tasmanian blue gum there, very strong smelling leaves. Um, and, uh, you know, it sort of replaced some of the traditional uh, English herbal uh, remedies and strong smelling mints and that kind of thing. So it's had a long history in Australia being used. Um, I mentioned some of the other uh, genera which are in the same Motaceae family. So we have things we call tea trees here, often Melaleucas, Liptospermans. But, you know, the tea tree oil market has actually surpassed uh, um, largely the eucalyptus oil market. It's also very strongly smelling. It's just got a, you know, different flavour again. Um, and some of that's even grown in New Zealand. So uh, that's many millions of dollars. Uh, in fact, last year, uh, I was actually as an expert witness in a federal court case where someone was trying to, um, uh, how would you say, impose a patent on their particular type of uh, tea tree that they were using to produce the tea tree oil and, you know, gain financial gut, you know, gain out of it. But uh, my evidence was such that Aboriginal people were using the same plants in 1788 when Europeans arrived. And how could you possibly put a patent on something that was already discovered and being used? So, yes, the very ancient tradition of using things like eucalyptus and tea tree oils. The advantage with them is that... Um, the plants um, themselves are used by Aboriginal people medicinally. So, you know, things like gum leaves were used uh, um, often in vapour baths. So people would uh, put the green leaves on a fire and sort of lean over the fire. They're getting all of this very strong uh, smoke, but, you know, filled full of the uh, 
the smell of the eucalyptus and that would help as a decongestant sort of opening up their passageways and their lungs if they had problem there. Also from the Aboriginal point of view that the strong smell is something that would drive out spirits. So with any healing system it's a mixture of things which have some chemical basis but also uh, you know sort of speak to the actual beliefs that people have about what causes unwellness, you know what causes sickness. So the a lot of the Aboriginal uh, medicines are ones which have a very strong smell um, and eucalyptus is prime in that uh, for driving these bad spirits that someone may have picked up walk, walking through scrub or perhaps walking past a burial ground or some sacred place um, um, inadvertently picking these things up. But the um, in, in terms of, um, we were talking about honey uh, just then, um, that the uh, scientists have been able to show that some of the benefits, the antiviral benefits that are, exist in the eucalyptus leaves and the tea tree le leaves can actually uh, transfer into the honey via the insects. So, so you, um, that's why um, in Australia, Manuka honey is actually sold as a medicine. Um, you can put it on your toast or whatever as, as a food, but it's actually used medicinally. So you've got plant, um, beneficial products from plants like eucalypts uh, being um, transferred across to things like honey via insects. Um, so that that's quite an interesting interesting concept of seeing that um, you know another organisms being uh, being you know utilised. Um, but yes, gum leaves uh, because of the uh, uh, very strong aroma, um, often used in cooking. Um, sometimes actually. I mean, people used earth ovens, so there was no metal containers and things. So people basically, if you had a, say a kangaroo that you had killed and wanted to cook, you would sort of skin it and, or in some areas you'd skin it, other times you would leave the skin on, but you would uh, dig a hole in the ground and you would sort of put a fire in it and heat up all these rocks. And then you would put a layering of fresh gum leaves over it. And then you'd put the carcass there, you'd wrap the carcass in gum leaves, and then you'd pile soil over the whole top so all the heat sort of kept in sort of like a, pr a bit of a pressure cooker maybe um, but yeah gum leaves were important to keep the the carcass clean from soil but also the gum leaves provided the steam you know, all the moisture out of them because they were green gum leaves um, but also the taste they were used as flavor enhancers and uh, the river red gum, Eucalyptus camaldulensis, seems it's very widespread species, different subspecies, but right across Australia. But that seemed to be universally used uh, in these earth ovens. So, uh, yeah, so it's used as flavouring. With, with a lot of the uh, plant uses I've documented, I've, I've found that it's a little bit limiting sometimes to put things too tightly in one category. Um, I mean, medicines are a case in point in that. Um, from a Western European perspective, we tend to think of medicines as something you take when you've got an ailment. But from Aboriginal people's point of view, they, uh, sure, they've got herbs and things which they'll take when they're feeling sick, but they would see other things as what they'd call in Creole uh, or uh, as uh, blood medicine, that things that they'd take to make sure they don't get sick. So some of their foods were sort of overlap with medicines in that sense. So they're things that make them feel better or perhaps uh, um, stop them getting sick, you know, to begin with. So, so yes, gum leaves are important there. I haven't said much about the bark of the gums, but um, they're uh, the bark of particularly again, the river red gum was seemed to be the favoured uh, bark to burn when one wanted to create the ash to uh, mix with chewing tobacco. Um, Aboriginal people across Australia used a lot of chewing tobacco. The, that's the, about 20 odd species of uh, native, toba native tobacco, same genus as uh, the, uh, um, the commercial tobacco, uh, Nicotiana. Um, but these are species uh, in Australia which are often grown around areas where there's been a recent fire. So Aboriginal people would burn the landscape to sort of um, uh, bring on you know the growth of all these native tobaccos so you can harvest the leaves and sort of chew them and maybe you get a mild effect but it's only when you put the uh, the alkaline ash of something like 
burning the bark of a gum tree, mixing that with it, that it actually releases the power of all the alkaloids um, in the leaves of the uh, um, of the uh, bush tobaccos. So you 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 need that source of ash. Uh, you need that alkaline chemical mixed in with it. Um, you know, in order to get the the real nicotine fix. I'm not a smoker, so I'm probably not qualified to explain what that rush is. But um, but that yes, the uh, the uh, the bark of the uh, eucalypt was uh, preferred means of producing the quality uh, alkaline material to mix with uh, you know bush tobacco. So that's yet another use of uh, you know, gum trees. Thank you so much, Philip. This is like amazing. I think I would like to ask one last question uh, before we open up for everyone to ask anything to Philip or to us. Um, and I would like to ask something related with art. Um, so more than in, on the commemoration of the uh, two centuries of European settlement in Australia, we had the first um, artwork made as a memorial to Aboriginal people that was commissioned by John Mundin. Uh, and I think he invited around 43 artists from indigenous people to collaborate with him. And this is actually the first uh, object that we have, like I think it's in Canberra Museum at the National Museum. Um, and taking this as a starting point of conversation, I think it would be interesting for people to know what are the various traditional objects that are made of eucalyptus or trees in Australia. And how are they being featured in museums? Um, well, yes, I, I, I do know John Mundine and uh, I've uh, visited the community where he was an art advisor up in the, the remote uh, Arnhem Land area, a place called Ramangidding, um, which is, uh, yeah, uh, uh, on the Aboriginal reserve land. And he was a, an art advisor there. And uh, a lot of these remote communities, most of their uh, a fair bit of their income comes through Aboriginal art. The Arnhem Land is also the area where uh, the, the bark, rather than being, uh, the bark is used as a canvas. So rather than just buying canvas or uh, hardboard or paper and drawing on it, people actually use the bark of these, uh, again, they're eucalypts, so uh, sort of like a, a northern stringy bark, uh, uh, eucalyptus uh, miniata. So yes, they cut the bark, it's sort of like a collar off the tree it actually kills the tree. So uh, when you, you you can spend hours driving along these remote bush roads, you always know when you're coming close to an Aboriginal art station because you see all of these dead trees along the road <laughs> where they've cut the bark from. But it, it doesn't deforest the area because these uh, um, favoured trees for producing the bark, which they use as a base for the painting, um, you know, they grow in a mixed forest. And uh, so if you go back from the road, there are a lot of trees there that are too far, you know, to get the bark sort of easily on the back of the, the wagon. So they tend to get left alone. So yes, the bark is used. Um, so uh, museums all around the world have got, you know, sheets of bark where well, they come off these gum trees and it does kill them, but uh, um, to such a level which the forest sort of regenerates. So it's not really a great problem. The bark, um, uh, cause I, I mentioned I was in the museum for almost 30 years. Uh, earlier on, I was a collection manager when I started and the barks were always a bit of a problem because if there's any change in the environment, the, uh, the, the flat pieces of bark want to take the shape that they were around the tree. And as the bark is bending, of course the pigments, because Aboriginal people use ochres, they don't bend, they just fall off in sheets. So uh, it's a good way of wrecking a bark painting, which is to allow any moisture to come in and um, you know, basically change the bark, get it moving, and and uh, all the all the ochres sort of peel off it. So, it, in many ways, it would be better for the art movement if you that people started painting painting on masonite and hardboard and canvas. But the market is such it's been going for over a hundred years that they prefer to paint on bark. And the South Australian Museum where I work is partly to blame because we've got. Uh, there, some of the earliest bark paintings um, that were ever collected in the 1880s off an island, uh, field island off the coast of Arnhem Land, and they are paintings on bark. However, uh, they're uh, they're on the uh, inside of 
bark sheets that were taken off a wet, uh, wet season shelter. So you can imagine, um, say, uh, up in that area from about, it varies from year to year, from about Christmas through to April, it's sort of constant rain. So you can imagine these people inside a bark hut, not much to do. So you've got these elderly people who are talking about all the dreaming stories to the younger people and they're actually painting them on the insides of the uh, shelter. So this European came along who was uh, mapping the coastline, Captain Carrington in the 1880s, and the, uh, uh, the Aboriginal people had moved on because they're seasonally, uh, only there seasonally, and uh, saw all these fantastic paintings inside, on the insides of these shelters. And he, he took the lot and uh, they ended, most of them end up in the South Australian Museum. But from that point onwards, uh, Europeans wanted paintings on bark, perhaps not realising that uh, they were, that was really, uh, you know, uh, roofing material that they were collecting, which happened to have a painting on it. So yes, the uh, uh, that that's the story about the bark sort of being uh, being used. Uh, there are other communities around northern Australia which have sort of felt the the, uh, the pressure of the art world and, and and have also sort of painted on bark. Um, but it's mainly in Arnhem Land where it's uh, almost universal. In the Arnhem Land area too, they used to take off the bark and uh, sort of stitch up the, rather than try and flatten them. And uh, today I've, I've been to art centres where they actually use stones and things to try and heat the bark to make it nice and flat. But in our other communities, they used to allow it to be like a collar and they would sew up either ends, but they would use them as uh, bone carriers, as coffins. So uh, Aboriginal people would have several stages of a burial, but the last stage, they would go to a, a burial platform and they'd just take the long bones and the skull <clears throat> and they'd put them in these coffins and uh, uh, sort of sew them up. And then that bark coffin, that bark from a gum tree would be taken and put in a sacred cave as sort of the final resting place. So um, that sounds like a very, uh, secret, sacred, highly uh, religious thing, and it is. However, uh, Aboriginal people realise that Europeans like them too. So you can go to the art centres and you can buy bark coffins, but you won't find bones in them, of course, but they are an item which uh, Aboriginal people have chosen to, uh, to make and, you know, out of bark and, you know, to paint and to sell to museums and things. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a, in some ways a more cultural use of the, uh, the artwork whereas a lot of the bark paintings, although they're very authentic uh, styles of art, um, they're uh, uh, often, or the bark, they, they tend to like putting them on square sheets because uh, the paintings they put on them were actually square too, because they, if I sort of move up a bit, the paintings actually came as a part of the chest and they were painted on during the Ngara ceremony, the initiations, so, um, the young initiates, uh, usually 13, 14 year old boys would have their country painted on their chests and they would sort of wear it right throughout the initiation and wouldn't even be allowed to wash it off. It usually uh, over the months, or sorry, weeks probably, after the initiation, it would gradually wear off. But um, a lot of the artwork, when you see it's a very square sort of shape, sometimes a little bit of an extension where the arms are, you, you know that that's, uh, that's actually a design that was really uh, one that intended to be on the chest of someone and uh, it's just been um, transported and put on a bark painting. So, um, so yes, bark, uh, eucalyptus uh, bark is uh, something that the uh, world art market, the uh, tribal art market, I think it's called, um, sort of forces upon Aboriginal people. So it would be much easier if the art advisor just uh, ordered up a whole lot of uh, canvas rolls and that arrived on the barge um, up the river and you know they painted on that but no they have to go out and have to chop it off trees because that's what the market um, art market uh, you know requires of them. Philip thank you so much I actually had no idea that uh, the bark painting is so popular and actually sounds like it's a little bit problematic as well from different perspectives. I personally used the bark in my artwork. So I printed directly with the bark and I know very well what it means to straighten the bark. So I used a combination of sun heat, water, continuous water and heavy 
objects to straighten the bark so I can actually roll it up in the fabric and the bark will give me this very nice flat um, print with all the structure and texture in it so it's and as soon as you take it off it goes back to either the spiral which we have in the gallery exhibited and the spiral comes from the roll because it repeats the the rolling of the fabric on a very tight roll or if I didn't use the bark and it was wetted then it will come back to its natural state so the bark is goes yeah it, it moves really um, hugely with humidity um, I'd love to ask a question from River, who is here with us. He is my friend and he is now currently in Australia. And I guess he has two questions because I already kind of suspect the answer. So one question is about birthing trees. And the second question he asked, believe they are called scarred trees, scarred trees too. So uh, is this the same thing? Are there two different things? Could you clarify for those of us who don't know anything about birthing trees or scarred trees? Well, funnily enough, uh, just just on two weeks ago, I came back from a field trip in uh, northeastern New South Wales, which uh, where I had to deal with uh, such things as scarred trees and birthing trees. So um, they're certainly part of what we call the ethnography, the early... Uh, accounts of Aboriginal people living traditionally in the country. Um, so the, taking the birthing trees first, they, they tend to be very uh, large gum trees. Some of these gum trees, are, uh, it's hard to age them exactly because the, the centre of the trees rotted out. So you, if you're doing a core through dendrochronology, you're, you're not going to go to the, to the wood that represented the original tree. But they reckon some of them are between four and uh, 500 years old so you know they were, they were adult trees before Europeans arrived and uh, some of these trees as they get older because heartwood most people don't realize but in a living tree the heartwood is essentially dead material it's the sapwood on the other side of the cambium uh, layer which is uh, all the cambium layers producing the bark and the sapwood on the inside but uh, so it's still inside the cambium but that's the living that's the living part of the tree, the uh, sapwood. So the heartwood uh, over time, particularly over hundreds of years, uh, sort of gets dry and gets borer damage, some of it, a bit, bit of water in it, so they tend to rot out. So the birthing trees tend to be trees which have um, somewhat hollow in the inside and that, that hollow extends to gaps between the trees. So uh, it's almost like a shelter which happens to have a tree uh, canopy above it. So uh, some of those spaces you could get quite easily two or three people uh, inside them. Um, in South Australia, some of the river red gums are so big that some of the early Ger German colonists uh, <coughs> actually uh, used them as, as uh, houses or at least camping places where they were building their main house. So the birthing trees <coughs> tended to be places where uh, women could go with uh, one or two of the uh, you know, elder uh, elderly women in the group as uh, midwives and uh, uh, away from the main group and sort of quietly uh, sort of give birth so um, um, as these trees tend to um, grow around the edge of faded camps because Aboriginal people are moving seasonally through the landscape so if you know uh, if someone if a woman was to give birth uh, at a particular camp they would have some idea where a good place would be to sort of quietly place her and uh, with all their needs um, so that that's the sort of birthing tree so um, I know uh, in more remote parts of Australia when I've been out site recording as an anthropologist uh, the, the places where women had given birth are, are immensely important to those women as, as sort of private things to do with their own life and, and statements of what they were doing at the time and uh, why they were there in terms of cultural sites um, in parts of New South Wales, they've sort of become very important cultural sites, but they're not named sites. They're, they're sort of a different category of importance, I guess. So that's sort of birthing trees. They're, they're sort of quiet places where they're, you know, a bit of shelter where, where uh, women would go to sort of give birth away from the main group, you know, get them away, a bit away from the main group. The, the scarred trees uh, are sort of carved into and, um, um, a lot of museums sort of collected them in the late 19th century because the, the trees were sort of in the you know stage of dying and uh, 
you know, some of the scars, uh, which are quite beautiful artwork. They're very abstract, um, a bit like bark paintings, but things which are being carved deeply into the heartwood of the tree. So the, the, uh, the bark is removed, exposing the centre of the tree, and you've got all these lines and abstract things carved into them. The trees tended to be um, around the edge of what they call a borer ground. And that's an area where uh, Aboriginal people uh, every few years will hold a big ceremony. And uh, so the trees are actually part of creating the space for the ceremony. And sometimes that also involved carving into their soil, um, building mounds and uh, abstract designs. So the trees were sort of a, a more permanent reminder of a whole lot of activity that would take place at the uh, at the ceremonial ground. <clears throat> They're often described as borer rings, so you'd have these carved trees, gum trees, usually box trees, around the edge, and then you'd have the borer ring in the middle. And those rings persisted um, for decades after the ceremonies uh, sort of ended, around the 1880s, 1890s, most of the last ones, just purely because uh, they'd had so many people dancing on them that the soil was all compacted so it wasn't you know there wasn't as much grass and things growing on it so it's uh, something that happens in archaeology all the time you know you have a paddock where the grass is a bit thinner because it's got a roman road under it or something else so it's a bit the borer rings are a bit like that something had happened to the soil through compaction from an aboriginal point of view uh, all of that dancing create created the site so the trees um, were sort of carved as a as another expression of that. I know uh, myself when doing field work um, um, at a place where there was a lot of ceremonial activity that that uh, a lot of the uh, participants uh, were very nervous whether I was actually going to drive over any of the ground where they had danced into because they saw it as so sacred, so imbued with the power of their dreaming that they couldn't possibly imagine someone driving a car over it, uh, you know, damaging that. So these borer rings with the carved trees around them are all part of that. What, what I'm finding now, of course, is that the contemporary Aboriginal community are, are sort of aware of this rich history. And uh, so they often go out and they see a, a, an old tree, which has got an odd scar on it. They, uh, you, know, um, you know, they do start wondering whether it's a boundary marker or a, or, or some carving or, or whether there's some hidden message perhaps in whatever's happened to the old tree. So um, yeah, it is, it is something that you know, one hears about <clears throat> when um, out doing clearances in forests you know, for a road going through or, or some sort of other development. So, uh, so they're the scarred trees. Uh, elsewhere, elsewhere across Australia, of course, some of the scarred trees are where bark was removed to make bark canoes. Um, in South Australia, where I live, uh, there's still uh, some of these old river red gums, which are still alive and still have the scar, often sort of growing around the edges, but you can still see where they took a big slab to make a canoe. So um, that's a more, less ceremonial, more utilitarian sort of use of the bark. And uh, of course, bark was also used for making shields, containers, and a whole lot of other things. But for those smaller things, um, after 20 or 30 years, you know, tended to grow over. So it's those larger uses of the uh, trees, you know, when a big bit of bark's been removed to sort of carve into the heartwood or, or whether, uh, or sapwood heartwood that's exposed, or whether uh, a big piece of bark's been taken off and, you know, for making canoe, they're the, they're the ones that we, that we can still see in the landscape today. Mm, Philip, thank you so much. I had no idea that there are two types of scar trees. The ones that I read about the ones that uh, the bark is removed for canoe making. But now I discovered a whole new dimension that actually there is carved trees directly into the hard, hardwood. So this is, this is fascinating. I never seen one and I would love to, maybe later you could send us some references if you cool. find one. Yeah. We have a yes, really sir. beautiful question from Alan Todd. And actually I just wanted to say, the floor is open to questions because Alan already typed, typed in the chat. I would love him actually personally to ask this question to you. 
and uh, then it's open to everybody. So I mute myself and I invite Alan to unmute himself and ask his question. Hola. You hear Hello. Me? Hello. Um, my name is Alan and I'm, I'm, work, I'm proposing for a start since uh, um, five, six years now, and I'm trying to, to develop a practice oriented to forest in, in, a, in what I've noticed in the, in the occidental art history, we really have this moment where the art artifact is not anymore considered as a religious thing. Uh, it's condemned by the Vatican that we cannot uh, pray in front of an object and the object is becoming empty of, of its spiritual power. And this is a very big evolution in, in Occidental art history because we really have this moment where art is religious and then after art is politic and then art is like, and we treat every art artifact the same, whether they're from uh, a painting of a church or a painting of uh, a contemporary painting. So now in the market of Occidentality, you will have religious artifacts that are today considered as art. But in the past, they were deep spiritual objects. And when I see uh, our relationship with our origin, and I understand that in the, in the 80s, uh, galleries wanted to explore this art of aborigines and, and they make it uh, contemporary art. But I'm questioning how do they feel that it is because I've seen that for stand for the back painting, it's supposed to represent a trip. It's supposed to, there's a spiritual connection with it. It's almost like a magic object. And then suddenly when we take the back painting and we put it in the museum on the side of a Picasso or whatever, then this, this magic is maybe big, take out of the object. And uh, so it's a form of colonization. It, it was made maybe to promote the culture of Aborigin and to fight colonization. But I feel maybe, so my question is, how do Aborigin live that story? Do they feel uh, expropriate of their, of their culture? I've seen many Aborigin becoming painter with oil painting and becoming international painter as Occidental thing. So I think there is a kind of a sort of collaboration to promote their culture. But I don't know, I have in my mind this very indigenous person who believes this object is magic and then suddenly sees this object in a museum. Is there any, is, is it totally accepted by Aborigines or, or do they feel we are rubbering their gods or do we feel, do, do they feel uh, something wrong about it, what we are doing with his art and treating, do they have the same? Yes, this is a question. And this is a very question for me because uh, I feel in, uh, in our contemporary, we have lost the spirituality of art and we deal it with artifact as any object in the market. And do they do the same now? Do they, do they still have this very strong religious connection with their art? And do they feel bad that we appropriate it and treat it as a uh, like artistic artifact? Yeah, well, look, it, it, um, your question's a bit sort of broader for a number of reasons. Um, um, perhaps I'll start with uh, examples of Bach paintings where they, they have painted very important religious uh, stories or dreaming, they often call them dreaming stories, creation stories onto them. So they're sort of a bit like uh, frozen moments, uh, you know, to do with a, a quite important ceremony linked with a creation story. So very important. Um, museums tend to uh, either by sending the curator out to uh, consult with the artists in the community or, or even bringing some of those artists in, there's a whole degree of consultation which now regularly happens. So you won't find, and I, I was the, um, curator for the main display that's still available in Adelaide um, um, at the uh, South Australian Museum. Um, so yes, uh, in terms of how people feel about it, they, they, don't, um, they do want to talk about their country and their connection. So they're quite happy for museums to buy them, of course, uh, and display them. Of course, they want to make sure they display properly. So there was an, uh, a time when uh, 
a couple of the, the main artists came down. They'd actually painted these very important Bach paintings. Um, we were going to display them, but we had so many of them in the one space, they almost felt that it was overpowering and perhaps we had too much power there and uh, we had to put some of them further apart. And so from their point of view, it was almost uh, like we had too much highly radioactive material. <laughs> we put it in too concentrated form. So that's just one example of how um, um, museums sort of cater for the, uh, um, or, uh, you know, wanting to include the artists and the community that produce the artwork in the, uh, in the story. In, in is, the there still rituals, is there still rituals, is there still uh, a religion, uh, an intact religious perspective of, is there any tribes that don't sell their art to the market, that don't, that, that don't want this connection with the, the occidental culture and they keep this art as a as a, a spiritual magic thing or is there no more anymore this is more like oh, no. yeah no there's communities that very much use the art as uh, as an essential part of their uh, ceremony and uh, and you know their their belief what they do is though uh, in quite a sensible way they recognize that um, those most uh, important intimate designs um, they keep to themselves so they it may only be a very subtle change, but what they paint on the Bart painting to sell to the art center, to the rest of the world, will have some subtle changes in it. So they, oh. they can sort of filter out, um, particularly in the desert. There's all these uh, Western desert paintings, which do happen to be on campus. Originally, they were painted directly onto the ground and they were ceremonially destroyed after the ceremony. Oh. Um, now they paint them on canvas and it, it did actually take a few of the uh, the very important uh, senior people in the 1960s to decide uh, where to draw the line. I mean, it, it, to the outside person, it all looks the same, the, the secret sacred design and what people are buying. But for the artists themselves, they can tell the difference. There's just something that's sort of being left out. Um, it's interesting that in places like um, um, Cape York Peninsula, uh, there's quite a tradition of for ceremonies making these carvings, not out of eucalyptus wood, there was a soft wood because in the earlier times they didn't have metal axes and things, so they needed a real soft wood to do carvings. So they used to carve these ancestral beings, they were seen by the community during ceremony and then they were just taken and left to naturally rot um, out in the scrub, out in the forest uh, after the ceremony. There came a point though when the Aboriginal people realised, particularly when anthropologists were around, that they could actually earn money from some of those uh, carvings. So, um, and for them that was good because they could actually sort of sell some of the uh, religious paraphernalia to a museum and, you know, the money would benefit the community, but also it would mean next time they held that ceremony there'd be a new set made. So they are the religious items. That same community, uh, um, once, um, usually it's about the time of the Second World War when um, the army had been, um, had enough outposts in Northern Australia where things like steel axes and rasps and metal tools became more widespread. Suddenly women had access to all of these tools. So they, they started making carvings, but they weren't allowed from, by their community to make religious paraphernalia because that was what the men did. So the women used to just um, use the, the, the wood carving tools to, to, to carve all the animals that they used to see in the landscape and hunt. So you have a whole tradition of all these carved animals, dugongs and birds and things, um, not directly related to the ceremonies, but nevertheless being carved by the women. Um, their own traditional design art styles are on them, so they're certainly authentic that way. But, you know, they start becoming a um, sort of force in the market. So all of that's time to uh, the decision by the community of what's sacred and, what, and what's secular and also the available, availability of the tools. And to varying degrees, you can see that in other parts of Australia. So that was why your question was a little bit more complex. Uh, yeah, I started... I have, no, I, I'm conscious about it. And now you're talking about the woman. We don't see so much women uh, uh, Aboriginal artists in the contemporary art market. And now you're, you're pointing out that those women uh, in some trips are, are doing this. Um, is it, 
we know we know now in occidental history that probably art was invented by women uh, with the cavern, with the Paleolithic art, and also with the evolution of painting. So painting would be in occidental culture a more a woman invention or more a woman practice. And I, I wonder if we can see a kind of a common pattern there where when it's real and real spiritual, it's still the woman doing. And when it's come to become secular and go in the market, we will, they will pick a man of the tribe and he will do the job. Is it like this or maybe I'm too simple? Well, look, in, in earlier times, uh, right across Australia, uh, men tended to specialize in, the, uh, in um, the depictions of the creation mythology. It didn't mean the women didn't know about it. It was just something that men did. So okay. when, when the community started doing paintings, and there, there are women who paint bark paintings, but what they do is tend to use them as catalogues of all the animals that they hunt and gather. And you'll find, because I'm a, an ethnobotanist, I like um, Aboriginal use of plants. So most of the artwork in my house is actually painted by women because I bought paintings, um, you know, of uh, the fish and the animals and the plants that are, you know, uh, are used for food and medicine. So women tend to specialize in that area and the men tend to specialize on things related to sacred sites. Uh, that was the old pattern. It, it is starting to sort of even up. So, uh, you know, you will find there more indigenous uh, artists. Of course, uh, you know, women were uh, very skilled in fiber crafts and things. Um, so making beautiful elaborate uh, baskets and mats and all sorts of other things. But, um, of course, you know, although they're a small part of the, the tribal art industry, um, you know, they're, they're not normally defined as art, although some of them are more sculptural now. But uh, um, I, th I think if one did an analysis of most of the art centres now, you'd, I think one would probably find there's more women, there are more women as crafts people and, and uh, artists as, than, than men. Um, but um, it depends on the region, so perhaps don't quote me on it. But it, um, but yes, that that's the trouble of def using a Western definition of art, whereas that doesn't really exist in Aboriginal culture. They um, they've got a more holistic view, and what they saw in terms of those very sacred drawings, um, they actually saw them as having power in itself. I mean, uh, I was involved in a repatriation project for a very long time. I still do a bit of it for the Australian Museum in Sydney of returning some of these religious objects back to these remote communities uh, because perhaps they shouldn't have never been collected to begin with. But um, I know in what awe um, that the senior people hold these, these objects and to the extent that sometimes I'm, I'm treated myself as if I'm contaminated by the power of the objects. I have to be smoked and have to camp on the outside of the community until the certain rituals that are done to cleanse me before I'm allowed to go into the community because I, I might make someone sick. So the, in, in, in your earlier question about are they still important, the, you know, the answer is certainly yes in many parts of central and northern Australia, just not so much the southern and eastern parts of Australia where colon, European colonisation started earlier and has been more uh, pervasive. There's still a very distinct Aboriginal community, but not as tied to all the uh, the earlier rituals and ceremonies. Philip, thank you so much. I think it feels like that we opened up a very interesting subject here. It feels like um, it is possible to actually go deeper into it in the near future. And this is, I think, what's going to happen in the second phase of the project as we explore a bit more, both the side of art and the connection with the sacred practices and the sacred sites and there are many more questions that are out there about that i would love to maybe invite someone else to ask a short question before we start wrapping up so if somebody has a burning question um right now please go for it you say burning question i haven't even mentioned fire stick farming which <laughs> oh. a, a important part of eucalypts and probably quite relevant to to portugal yeah, exactly. That's, I think that is also something that we decided to take into our second phase of the project because it's too big. So <laughs> does anybody have a yeah, burning question about paramedic trees? 
Is there a question? Um, if there are no question, what I would like to maybe ask is um, going a little bit back to just, just to wrap up and just to ask you, Philippe, from your perspective, of course, with that knowledge that you heard or you read or you have from even that discussion, how do you feel with the current situation and the quite problematic issues that we're having in Europe and in some other places in the world with the, with the attitudes to the eucalyptus trees and with, of course, with the presence of plantations, but also even going beyond plantations feels like it's been already deeply ingrained here into our psyche, the attitude towards tree, which is going much more towards hate. And I would love to ask you the question, what do you feel can change to kind of expand this attitude and to shift that perspective? What can be done? Well, uh, yeah, look, it's, it's, uh, it's a diff again, it's a difficult question for uh, a number of reasons. Um, in Australia, of course, uh, eucalypts uh, are occurring in landscapes uh, like the southwest of Western Australia, which is a biodiversity hotspot in the world uh, where you've got thousands of species of plant in you know relatively small area the only other part of the world that that is similar is actually turkey and as in terms of biodiversity in a temperate landscape and of course turkey is where lots of our uh, vegetables fruits and you know plum trees peaches all of those things come from so you can see that there are hot spots around the world where the climate for the last few million years has been stable enough where you get these biodiversity hotspots. Much of Europe, of course, is under an ice sheet uh, up until even just a few thousand years ago, you know, uh, during the Pleistocene. So you're looking at floras and faunas that are having to move, you know, from the sort of Africa, southern areas, sort of north as the more lands, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, available. So. What that, what that basically means is that uh, a place, and oh, uh, rather than pick on Portugal, I'll pick on England, um, it's got a flora and fauna that, that is, that is um, nowhere near as diverse as uh, most parts of Australia. Um, Australia too has its uh, areas where they're not quite as diverse. Um, Central Australia used to get, uh, during the dry and cold periods, uh, used to lose a lot of its uh, vegetation. So during the warmer, wetter periods, uh, a lot of the salt bushes and gum trees from the south migrate. This is over, of course, for many hundreds of years, but migrate north. So you end up this sort of interesting flora, which has uh, very strong elements from the southern temperate area, as well as a, a few relic species from a, a, a wetter, warmer period um, that are still hung out in some of the uh, remote water holes and you know, creek systems feeding in from the north. Um, but yes, in terms of um, how our trees sit, I mean, uh, there, there are parts of the landscape where perhaps one species dominates for a patch or two, but even there you'll find, um, I'm thinking of some of my favourite places in Central Australia, you get these beautiful blue mallees where the leaves are actually blue, which are low growing on the flats, but as soon as you hit a creek, you know, you, the river red gums, which they often call white gums there, but you get totally different species that grows along the creek. So you find there are different species that are still in the broader landscape. They've just sort of, you know, stick to certain sort of uh, niches, uh, if you like. Um, the, the problem of growing any sort of plantation and um, some species of eucalypt um, and sometimes globulus, eucalyptus globulus are grown in plantations because it's one of the fastest growing hardwoods you can imagine. But uh, um, I think I may have mentioned when we were talking before, uh, during the 60s and 70s, I grew up in a family which uh, my father was part of that revolution of what they call the Australian native plant revolution, where people were collecting species from all over Australia and trying to put them in the gardens. You know, they were pushing back from the old standard English style gardens with oak trees and willows and trying to get more Australian plants. And some of them sort of worked, but... Um, in the area I grew up in, the Mount Lofty Ranges, uh, Tasmanian blue gums, eucalyptus globulus, was planted everywhere. Grew really fast, but 
sort of 15 years after you planted them, you'd have this massive tree and then they started falling down because they were just uh, had all these borers. I mentioned these uh, uh, longicorn beetles, these beetles which have grubs that put all these magnificent holes in them, but the, uh, the, the borers didn't have any, uh, you know, the tree was outside of its normal area, which was Tasmania and grown in South Australia, didn't have the predators and all the, the natural, uh, you know, corrections on it. And so uh, it wasn't quite a monoculture, but lots of people growing these big trees and, you know, we were all having to employ people to chop them down because they were falling over in storms and crushing cars and houses and, and they were very big trees. So uh, even, even more of a problem. So the Australian native plant sort of area uh, sort of morphed into a more reasonable uh, native plant industry whereby people would worked out the ecological zone, if you like, of particular plants. So it's nowhere near as big a problem, but it was a problem sort of back then. So yes, taking any plant um, and in where I grew up, uh, it's a temperate area in Adelaide here. So most of our weeds come from uh, the same temperate zone in South Africa, um, a lot of our worst weeds. But I hear, uh, I've not been there, but in Cape Town, some of their worst weeds are actually from uh, our side of the Indian Ocean. So you have plants that um, like to stick to a particular zone, temperate zone, and uh, but if they, they plant it outside of that, uh, for a while at least, they, uh, they don't have any of the natural predators and they, uh, they cause real problems. Whereas in the tropics where I work, um, um, it's pretty much uh, similar plants you find right through the Indonesian archipelago. I mentioned East Timor with its eucalypts and then Northern Australia. So, and then pushing out into the other side in the Pacific and New Guinea, you got gum trees in New Guinea and wallabies. Um, we got wallabies in East Timor too. So uh, um, it, it, you, you find that uh, the flora and fauna uh, have, a, have a sort of greater mix. So it's more of a problem for those isolated land masses like you know South Africa and southern Australia which have got massive oceans all around them and and uh, some of the organisms escape from from those zones and get into other temperate parts of the world and uh, cause real problems just like some of our melaleucas which are in the same Motaceae uh, family as eucalypts uh, are basically drying up the you know the uh, the swamps in Florida because uh, you know nothing's you know they become a weed there so yeah, I think I think um, exotic species becoming weeds um, is an, a problem everywhere in the world. But uh, also, you know, monocultures doesn't matter how good the species is. Uh, that by even the the term monoculture, it's you know clearly not brought all the other species. And Eucalyptus globulus, uh, the Tasmanian blue gum, that grew in a mixed forest. So. Um, you know, got all these other species, other animals. Um, you've got a understory, a middle story. So you know, it's part of a whole ecosystem. So you you're just taking one element of it and putting it in, um, um, you know, hillsides and things over in Portugal. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that it causes problems. Philip, thank you so much for sharing this. I just wanted to add that. In the future development of the project, we will also continue connecting with um, the Aboriginal knowledge and with Aboriginal elders, especially those who have something to say about the ecological possibilities and the possibilities of actually working with these trees. And we, I have a feeling that they might even have ideas for how we can work with these trees here in in Europe, mm -hmm. in Siberia, but also in other places. Um, I would like to thank with, express huge gratitude to Dr. Philip Clark for being here with us today and for all of you being present. Uh, if you have any more questions that you would like to actually address, you can put them in the chat right now uh, or send them later to us. I already um, put in the chat the next conversation which happens on the 5th of November at five o'clock Lisbon time. It will be on the subject of intangible heritage of forests and what the forests mean to us uh, beyond their economic value. So we will talk about all other types of values and heritage other than 
utilitarian or economic with Anna Agus, who is um, a specialist and researcher, um, spent lots of years of her life looking at eucalyptus trees. And Ana Maria Monsalve Cuartes from Colombia, who is, uh, whose actual name, uh, her title of her PhD is Intangible Heritage of Forest. She worked in Colombia, Mexico, and now she is based and she is working in Portugal. And uh, as uh, Inesh said at the beginning of the conversation, this is a multi-phase project, so you can sign up to Sarah Project or on my website and you will continue receiving information about this project and yeah i would love to thank everybody for being present today and uh, until our next conversation